Hi, my name is Katherine Bolek, and for my STAT 512 final project, I'll be looking at serious crime data and applying a linear regression analysis to determine what environmental factors we can use to predict and reduce crime in the future. More specifically, we are going to discuss violent crime, which is defined by the FBI as cases of murder, rape, robbery, and aggravated assault. Understanding what environmental and socioeconomic factors lead to crime is crucial in the attempt to reduce it at its roots. Crime data is an exceptionally valuable tool in determining predictive policing efforts or community resource allocation and even local and state budget development. They can show where more resources are needed in a community as well as where fewer resources are needed as that community grows safer. There has been and there continues to be extensive studies on crime. Most of the research I came across aimed to understand crime in specific areas, not holistically. A previous study was tasked to explain crime in metropolitan and non-metropolitan areas, and their work involved social disorganization theory and civil community theory. Other analyses of crime prediction have used linear regression models as we will use today. All research sought after the same question, what causes people to commit crimes? The research questions we are going to try to answer today are, can we develop a linear regression model to predict the rate of crime? And which factors present the greatest statistical significance in their impact on violent crime? We will use a global F-test to determine what predictors belong in the model. The null hypothesis will be beta i equals zero, and the alternative hypothesis will be not all beta i is equal to zero. The data we're going to look at comes mostly from the Kaiser Family Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization that collects data on national health issues. The crime rate data comes from the FBI crime statistics. I actually combined two data sets using all the predictors from a data set on Kaggle and then adding in the FBI crime rate data from the same year. Right off the bat, there are some limitations of this data set. There are only 51 data points, each representing information for a US state, and then an additional data point for Washington, DC. So to ensure that we have at least 10 times the number of predictor variables and data points, we have to limit our analysis to only five predictors. If we were to include more, we likely would not be able to make accurate or conclusive inferences about their relationships to each other or to the response variable. The five exploratory variables we're going to use are all continuous and they are income, which is the median household income in dollars, unemployment, which is the percent of the population that is unemployed, high school degree, which is the percent of adults 25 and older with a high school degree, metropolitan area, which is the percent of the population that lives in metropolitan areas, and young, which is the percent of the population that is between the ages of 18 to 34. A few of the predictors that I chose to omit from the model are non-citizen, which is the percent of the population that is not a US citizen, and Gini index, which is a measure of income disparity across a population. Sometimes this index may overstate income inequality and can obscure important information about income distribution, so for simplicity's sake, I chose not to move forward with that predictor. The response variable Y is the crime rate, which is measured as the number of violent crimes per 100,000 people. Measuring this crime rate rather than the number of crimes is important because it standardizes the data and corrects for the different population sizes in each state. Here is our summary of the first order model along with the ANOVA table. From this, we can see two significant predictors, unemployment and age. We know these are significant based on their large t-values and their small p-values. Our p-value for the full model is 7.9 times 10 to the negative 10th, which is far less than 0.05, so this indicates significance. The R-squared value is 0.6687, and the adjusted R-squared value is 0.6318, which means that this original model, we can explain about 63% of the crime. From the scatter plots of our variables, we can see that there exists some correlation between income and high school, and then maybe some between income and metropolitan areas. On the right, we have the correlation matrix, which shows the correlation between all combinations of two predictors. The diagonal is all ones because the predictor always has 100% correlation with itself. The highest correlation appears to be between high school and income at 0.65, followed closely by high school and unemployed at 0.62. These combinations of predictors make logical sense to be related. The correlation values aren't too concerning, but this is definitely something to keep in mind as we move forward in choosing a model. From the added variable plots, we see a negative relationship with income, which is to be expected, as well as a strong positive relationship with unemployment and age. Metropolitan areas and high school degrees do have a slight positive relationship, but not nearly as significant. The almost horizontal line indicates that these predictors do not add much information beyond what is already in the model. We will keep this in mind as we move forward with the model building process. There are several assumptions that we need to check. 
The data set should follow a linear relationship, the residual should have constant variance and follow a normal distribution, and we should look for potential outliers. First checking linearity, we check the residuals versus fitted values plot, and we see that this data set does not exhibit a linear relationship at all. Checking for non-constant variance, we run the brown Forsyth test. The output shows a p-value of 0 0.06867, which is greater than the significance level of 0 0.05. The p-value is not too much higher than the critical value, but the test concludes that the difference is not statistically significant, so this means that the data does not violate the constant variance assumption, and we fail to reject that null hypothesis. Next, we conduct a Shapiro-Wilk normality test. The resulting p-value is 0.1715, which is much larger than the significance level of 0.05, so we can conclude that this data does not violate the normality assumption. Visually, we can see this to be true as well. From the QQ plot, you can see that the data points don't lie exactly on the line, but are pretty consistently close to it throughout. As for potential outliers in the data, it looks like from these plots that data point 9 may be of concern. The app line shifts up drastically to accommodate this point, so we will keep this in mind when we start doing tests for influential points later in the analysis. So as a summary of the assumption checking, the data passes the Brown-Forsyth test, passes the Shapiro-Wilk test, it does violate the linearity assumption, and does have a potential outlier. In order to correct the linearity of the model, we need to look into transforming one or some of the predictors. Because our data violated the linearity assumption but satisfied constant variance and normality, we looked at transforming some of the predictors to straighten out the data. This process is often a lot of trial and error, and after trying many different combinations of transformations, the following model produced the most linear output. As you can see, all predictors except unemployment have been inverted. On the right, we can compare the residuals versus fitted plots for the original model and the transform model. It is clear that the transform model corrects almost all of the nonlinearity. We know now that the linearity assumption has been fixed, but before moving on, we need to recheck our other assumptions with the transform model. Running the brown Forsyth test again, we get a p-value of 0.5482, which is much higher than the significance level of 0.05 and much higher than the p-value of 0.06867 from our original model. Therefore, we can conclude that the model still satisfies the constant variance assumption. As for the Shapiro-Wilk test, we get a p-value of 1.938 times 10 to the negative fifth, which is far lower than the significance level and far lower than our p-value of 0.1715 from our original model. This does mean that our new model fails this test and violates the normality assumption. However, it is interesting to note that the normal QQ plot looks much better for our transform data than it did for our original model. The only difference is that now data point 9 deviates extensively from the rest of our data points, whereas in our original model it did not. It appears that the data point 9 severely impacts the results of the Shapiro-Wilk test, despite the rest of the data indicating normality. I think this is justification for rejecting the results of the Shapiro-Wilk test and moving forward with our analysis, assuming the transform model is normal. We know from the box plot that data point 9 is an outlier, but we need to test if it is also influential. The influence plot below shows data point 9 is very large, indicating it likely is influential. There are several values we can use to test this. DFITs, DF betas, and Cook's distance. Because this data set is small or medium sized, we look for any points that have a DFITs or DF betas value of over 1. For Cook's distance, anything between the 20th and 50th percentile is considered moderately influential, and anything over the 50th percentile is considered majorly influential. For all three tests, only data point 9 is above these critical values. Data point 9 has a DFITs value of 1.8113. DF betas, all predictors are above 1, and Cook's distance of 0.8947, which falls in the high end of the moderately influential range. Now that we know definitively that data point 9 is influential, we can make decisions on how we want to move forward. Data point 9 is Washington, D.C., which has an unusually high rate of crime. Washington, D.C. also happens to be a 100% metropolitan area, which likely contributes to this higher rate. Because DC shows significantly different rates of crime than any of the other states, I am going to remove this data point. For future research, I recommend crime in DC be analyzed separately instead of part of the US state's data set. Now we are going to determine what predictors to keep in the model. Here is the best subsets table, which measures SSEP, R squared, adjusted R squared, CP, AICP, SBCP, and PressP. When selecting a model, we look to maximize R-squared and adjusted R-squared and minimize all other values. Taking this into consideration, it appears from this table that the best candidates for the model are P equals 3 and P equals 6. The scenario P equals 6 
does not satisfy as many conditions as p equals 3, so we can justify selecting p equals 3 for our model. The added variable plots from earlier can confirm this choice as well, as we determined that Metro and High School do not add any additional information in predicting crime beyond what is already contained in the other predictors. This method of selection does suggest we remove income as well, which is not information that we received from the added variable plot, but it is something that we saw when looking at the scatter plots. If you'll remember, there was a slight concern over multicollinearity between income and metro and income in high school. The model we will move forward with now contains only unemployment and age. To make sure that we have chosen the best model, let's perform a k-fold validation to compare the root MSE and the R squared values between candidate models. This method works by splitting the data randomly into k folds, which here we use k equals 10. Then we fit the model with the other k minus 1 folds and calculate the predictive mean square error for the current testing set. Then we take the average over the k folds. For p equals 3, we have an R MSE of 105.3334 and an R squared of 0.4823. For p equals 6, we have an RMSE of 111.7841 and an R squared of 0.4284. p equals 3 yields the smaller error and the higher R squared, so we conclude that we made the right decision and our model with just unemployed and age is the best. Now that we have picked our best model, let's check assumptions one last time. Brown Forsyth test yields a p-value of 0.5655, which means we do not reject the null hypothesis and we conclude constant variance. Shapiro-Wilk test yields a p-value of 0.2263, so we also do not reject the null hypothesis and conclude the data follows a normal distribution. Remember, we did not pass the Shapiro-Wilk test when we included data 0.9, so removing that point has allowed us to correct the assumption violation. And the residual versus fitted plot still shows a strong linear relationship, so we are good on that front as well. In order to fully answer our research questions, we still need to validate our final model with a hypothesis test. Here we are performing a partial f-test to see if unemployed is significant. The critical F value is calculated as 4.0471. To evaluate the F statistic, we look at the extra sum of squares, which can be found by running the ANOVA table between the full and reduced models. The reduced model excludes unemployed, while the full model includes it. The F statistic is shown as 28.534. Because this is greater than our critical F value, we can reject the null hypothesis and conclude that unemployed is a significant predictor in our model. We can perform the same hypothesis test for young age. Our critical value remains the same at 4.0471. This time our reduced model excludes young age while our full model does not. The F statistic is shown as 9.96 and because this is greater than our critical F value, we can reject the null hypothesis and conclude that young age is a significant predictor in our model. Now that we have our final model, let's take a look at the summary in the NOVA table. It looks like our predictors are significant with low p-values. The p-value of the overall model has remained low at 1.412 times 10 to the negative sixth, but our r-square values have taken a hit since narrowing down our model. We now have an r-squared value of only 0.4363 and adjusted r-square value of 0.4123, compared to our original r-squared value of 0.6687. While our r-squared may have decreased, this does not mean that our model is worse. Our final model does not violate any assumptions and all our predictors are significant in the model to predict crime. We can now revisit our research questions. With our best linear regression model, we can account for about 44% of the crime. The final model contained two significant predictors and did not violate any of the first order assumptions, so we can conclude that with this data set, we have successfully developed a linear regression model to predict crime. Additionally, we looked at which factors present the greatest statistical significance in their impact on violent crime, and our hypothesis tests on the final model conclude that both unemployment and young age are significant. These two predictors have the strongest relationship to the response variable, while our predictors of income, metropolitan, and high school did not provide any statistical significance. Even though we were able to successfully build a linear regression model to predict crime, there are still plenty of limitations with this data and with the analysis. First, the size of the data plays a large role in our ability to predict the crime rate. We only had 51 data points, but had we had a larger data set, we wouldn't have had to limit our model to only five predictors. Additionally, I would recommend using county or city data in future analysis. Even though we use crime rate rather than the number of crimes total, each state still has its own regional environment, population size, and population density in cities and rural areas, and could benefit from being analyzed individually. Some of the previous research on this topic used regression analysis and both traditional social disorganization and civic community theories, which turned out to be good predictors of some, but not all types of crime in the largest metropolitan areas. However, their predictive power declined substantially when applied to the most rural communities. Different types of crime might require different analysis techniques. 
Our main assumption violation was nonlinearity, so a higher order model might be better suited for this data. We transformed our predictors, but as I mentioned earlier, it was a lot of trial and error, meaning that it was not necessarily optimized. Future research could look to utilize some optimization techniques to better the model. All in all, we were still able to take our original first order model and properly diagnose and continuously improve it to our best model. Thank you.